Robert Fulton by Scientific American, edited by Rufus Porter, for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11, Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Robert Fulton by Scientific American, edited by Rufus Porter, from Scientific American, Volume 2, Number 1, September 26, 1846, for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection, 11, Science. Robert Fulton, a celebrated engineer whose name is connected with steamboat navigation, was born in the town of Little Britain, in the state of Pennsylvania, in 1765. His genius disclosed itself at an early period. He was attracted to the shops of mechanics, and at the age of seven he painted landscapes and portraits in Philadelphia. Thus he was enabled in part to purchase a small farm for his widowed mother. At the age of twenty-one he, by the advice of his friends, repaired to London to place himself under guidance of Mr. West, the painter, and by him was kindly received and admitted as an inmate of the house for several years prosecuting his business as painter he spent two years in devonshire where he became acquainted with the duke of bridgewater and with lord stanhope well known for his attachment to the mechanic arts in seventeen ninety three he engaged in the project of improving inland navigation and in seventeen ninety six obtained patents for double inclined plane and for machines for spinning flax and making ropes. The subject of canals now chiefly occupied his attention, and at this period, in 1796, his work on canals was published. In his profession of civil engineer, he was greatly benefited by his skill in drawing and painting. He went to Paris in 1797, and being received into the family of Joel Barlow, he there spent seven years studying chemistry, physics, and mathematics, and acquiring a knowledge of the French, Italian, and German languages. In December 1797, he made his first experiment on submarine explosion in the Seine, but without success. His plan for a submarine boat was afterwards perfected. In 1801, while he was residing with his friend, Mr. Barlow, he met in Paris Chancellor Livingston, the American minister, who explained to him the importance in America of navigating boats by steam. Mr. Fulton had already conceived the project as early as 1793, as appears by his letter to Lord Stanhope. He now engaged anew in the affair, and at the common expense of himself and Mr. Livingston, built the boat on the Seine in 1803, and successfully navigated the river. The principles of the steam engine he did not invent. He claimed only the application of that machine to water wheel for propelling vessels. In 1806 he returned to America. He and Mr. Livingston built, in 1807, the first boat, the Claremont, 130 feet in length, which navigated the Hudson at the rate of five miles an hour. Nothing could exceed the surprise and admiration of all who witnessed the experiment. The minds of the most incredulous were changed in a few minutes. Before the boat had made the progress of a quarter of a mile, the greatest unbeliever must have been converted. The man who, while he looked on the expensive machine, thanked his stars that he had more wisdom than to waste his money on such idle schemes, changed the expression of his features as the boat moved from the wharf and gained her speed, and this complacent expression gradually softened into one of wonder. The jeers of the ignorant, who had neither sense nor feeling to suppress their contemptuous ridicule and rude jokes, were silenced for a moment by a vulgar astonishment, which deprived them of the power of utterance, till the triumph of genius extorted from the incredulous multitude which crowded the shores, shouts and acclamations of congratulation and applause. In February 1809, he took out his first patent. In 1811 and 1812, he built two steam ferry boats for crossing the Hudson. 
he contrived also a very ingenious floating dock for the reception of those boats in eighteen thirteen he obtained a patent for a submarine battery conceiving the plan of a steam man-of-war the government in march eighteen fourteen appropriated three hundred twenty thousand dollars for constructing it and appointed him the engineer in about four months she was launched with the name of fulton the first but before this frigate was finished fulton had paid the debt of nature end of robert fulton by scientific american edited by rufus porter for the librivox coffee break collection eleven science Rings in the Wood, Age of Trees, by John Gaylord Coulter, for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11, Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rings in the Wood, Age of Trees, by John Gaylord Coulter from plant life and plant uses for the librivox coffee break collection eleven science have you ever noticed the cut end of a freshly felled tree there before you lies the record of a history which has run through many years perhaps through hundreds of years to look at the rings in the wood to notice carefully the beauty of the layering to remember the generations upon generations of green leaves whose work in each season's sunlight went into the making of this wood to think of all the intricate processes and forces of which we know so little except that they have been concerned in this matter this stirs our wonder and our admiration if you were there when the tree fell you smelled its fragrance and perhaps saw the sap oozing from that wood which lies just beneath the bark you noted that the wood is divided into two quite distinct zones the outer and usually lighter zone is the sap wood the rest is heart wood it is common to speak of the sap wood as alive and of the heart wood as dead but this is not exactly accurate many of the cells through which sap runs are already dead so though the trunk as a whole may have endured for centuries only a comparatively small part of it has been alive at any one time this live zone lies between the outer bark and the heartwood and the most active part of it is as you know the cambium by understanding the way in which the cambium works we can understand how the rings in the wood are formed perhaps you have heard that each one of these rings indicates a year of growth and that by counting the rings you can tell the age of the tree this is not strictly true these rings are often called annual rings which implies of course that each one of them represents the growth of one year it is better to call them growth rings for more than one may be formed in a year it is true that a ring usually represents a season's growth but that does not explain why the ring is there the fact that a bricklayer stops work at night does not mean that the wall of bricks he is building will show by lines where he left off at night and where he began in the morning so with the rings they are not caused by the fact that the tree stops work over winter they are caused by the fact that the last cells formed in the fall are much smaller than the first cells formed in the spring just so the brick wall would be marked off into distinct layers if the mason laid small bricks the last thing every night and large ones the first thing every morning the rings are caused then by the difference in size between adjacent cells layers of small cells lie against layers of larger cells during freezing weather the cambium is not active when in spring the sap ascends from the roots and conditions for growth are right again the cambium begins to form what is called spring wood and the cells of this spring wood are much larger than the last cells which were formed the fall before 
a long period of drought may cause the cambium to become inactive just as winter causes it to become inactive in other words very dry weather has the same effect upon growth that freezing has so if a long summer drought is followed by a warm wet fall two growth rings as you can readily see are likely to be formed in some tropical regions it has been noted that alternating wet and dry seasons appear to have about the same effect in producing rings that winter and summer have end of rings in the wood age of trees by john gaylord coulter for the librivox coffee break collection eleven science Evaporation by John Gaylord Coulter for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Evaporation by John Gaylord Coulter from Plant Life and Plant Uses for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11. Science Evaporation is the name of a process. It is the changing of a substance from a liquid or a solid into a gas. Usually we think only of liquids as evaporating, but there are a few solids which change directly into gas. Camphor is an example. Evaporation is a process with which all living things are much concerned. It occurs at the surface of your body as well as at the surface of a plant's body. You have noticed on hot summer days that you are much more uncomfortable when perspiration sticks to you than you are when it quickly evaporates. People speak of sticky heat and of dry heat. The former is much more uncomfortable than the latter. This illustrates a matter which affects plant life as well as our own. On those sticky hot days of August, you may have heard the expression that the humidity is great. That expression refers to the air. It refers to the fact that in the air there is an unusual amount of water. This water is, of course, in the gaseous state. The humidity of air is the quality it obtains from the presence of water particles in it. The more water particles there are in the air, the less rapidly will evaporation take place. This reminds you of solution and osmosis. There is the same principle involved. The rate of diffusion of particles in both solution and evaporation depends on the difference in their abundance solution is more rapid when the particles of the solute are less abundant in the solvent diffusion of sugar in tea is most rapid when it is first put in it gradually slows down evaporation is more rapid when the air has in it few particles of the substances evaporating than it is when the air has in it many of such particles water evaporates more rapidly when the humidity of the air is slight than when it is great this is a matter which affects plant life as well as our own, though in different ways. Evaporation is a cooling process. The more it is checked at the surface of our bodies, the more we feel the heat. Why is it that evaporation cools the surface at which it occurs? Remember the molecules. Molecules are always in motion. Though the mass which they compose may be stationary, the individual molecules are always dancing about as much as their surroundings will let them. Now these dancing molecules at the surface of a liquid tend to dance off into the air, especially if it is dry air. This is the cause of evaporation. The warmest molecules are the most vigorous dancers. They are the most likely to fly off into the air, and, as they go, they take their heat with them. This lowers the temperature of the whole surface. If, on the contrary, the warmest particles do not fly off the surface on account of the abundance of them already in the air, and if the surface concern is a human skin, 
the person inside of it is sure to be uncomfortable this fact that evaporation causes loss of heat has been proved to be of advantage to plants that are exposed to high temperatures it appears in some cases to prevent the internal temperature from rising to a point which seriously impairs the life processes with plants it is rapid evaporation rather than slow evaporation which is likely to cause trouble in fact plants thrive in greatest abundance in tropical forests where the humidity is always great and where evaporation is much less than in drier climates on bright dry days of summer especially during a drought when the soil as well as the air has become dry many plants are likely to suffer water evaporates from them more rapidly than the roots are able to supply it cells lose their turgidity and this causes wilting the grass turns brown and the corn in the fields fires as the farmers say so far as plants are concerned evaporation appears to be a hindrance as well as a help plants can stand heat better than we can but they cannot stand loss of water so well it is easier for us to take a drink than it is for them to get more water plants which live in dry places as in deserts are mostly plants whose construction protects them against evaporation their power to retain water is much greater than that of plants which live in regions where water is more abundant End of Evaporation by John Gaylord Coulter for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science The Alimentary Canal of the Rabbit for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie the Alimentary Canal of the Rabbit, from Textbook of Biology, Part 1, Vertebrata. Section 16, Figure 1, represents the general anatomy of the rabbit, but is especially intended to show the alimentary, equals food, canal, shortened to a certain extent, and with the proportions altered in order to avoid any confusing complications. It is evidently simply a coiled tube, coiled for the sake of packing, with occasional dilatations, and with one side shunt, the cecum, C-A-E, into which the food enters and is returned to the main line after probably absorbent action, imperfectly understood at present. A spiral fold in this cul-de-sac, bottom of sac, which is marked externally by constrictions, has a directive influence on the circulation of its contents. The student should sketch figure one once or twice and make himself familiar with the order and names of the parts before proceeding. We have, in succession, the mouth, M, separated from the nasal passage, N-A, above the palate, the pharynx, P-H, where the right and left nasal passages open by the posterior nares into the mouth, the esophagus, O-E-S, the bag-like stomach, its left, section 6, end, being called the cardiac, C-D-S-T, and its right the pyloric end, P-Y, the U-shaped duodenum, DDNM, and the very long and greatly coiled ilium, IL. The duodenum and ilium together form the small intestine, and the ilium is dilated at its distal end into a thick-walled sacculus rotundus, SR, beyond which point comes the large intestine. The colon, CO, and rectum, R, continue the main line of the alimentary canal, but at the beginning of the large intestine, there is also inserted a great side shunt, the cecum, CAE, ending blindly in a fleshy, vermiform appendix, V-A-P. The figure will indicate how the parts are related better than any verbal description can. Between the coiling alimentary tube and the body walls is a space, into which the student cuts when he begins dissecting. This is the peritoneal cavity, P-T. A thin, transparent membrane, the mesentery, holds the intestines in place and binds them to the dorsal wall of this peritoneal space. Section 17. The foodstuffs of an animal, the unstable compounds destined ultimately to be worked into its life, and to leave it again in the form of catastases, section 13, fall into two main divisions. 
The first of these includes the non-nitrogenous foodstuffs, containing either carbon together with hydrogen and oxygen in the proportion of H2O, the carbohydrates, or carbon and hydrogen without oxygen, the hydrocarbons. The second division consists of the nitrogenous materials, containing also carbon, hydrogen, a certain amount of oxygen, sulfur, and possibly other elements. Among the carbohydrates, the commonest are starch and cellulose, which are insoluble bodies, and sugar, which is soluble. The hydrocarbons, fats, oils, and so on, form a comparatively small proportion of the rabbit's diet. The proverb of oil and water will remind the student that these are insoluble. The nitrogenous bodies have their type in the albumen of an egg, and muscle substance and the less modified living protoplasm of plants. A considerable proportion of the substance of seeds, bulbs, and so on, are albuminous bodies, or proteids. These are also insoluble bodies, or, when soluble, will not diffuse easily through animal membranes. Section 18. Now the essential problem which the digestive canal of the rabbit solves is to get these insoluble or quasi-insoluble bodies into its blood and system. They have to pass somehow into the circulation through the walls of the alimentary canal. In order that a compound should diffuse through a membrane, it must be both soluble and diffusible, and therefore an essential preliminary to the absorption of nutritive matter is its conversion into a diffusible, soluble form. This is affected by certain fluids, formed either by the walls of the alimentary canal or by certain organs called glands, which open by ducts into it. All these fluids contain small quantities of organic compounds of the class called ferments, and these are the active agents in the change. The soluble form of the carbohydrates is sugar. Proteids can be changed into the, of course, chemically equivalent, but soluble and diffusible, the peptones and fats and oils undergo a more complicated but finely similar change. Section 19. We shall discuss the structure and action of a gland, glands, a little more fully in a subsequent chapter. Here we will simply say that they are organs forming each its characteristic fluid or secretion, and sending it by a conduit, the duct, to a point where its presence is required. The saliva in our mouths, tears, and perspiration are examples of the secretions of glands. Section 20. In the mouth of the rabbit, the food is acted upon by the teeth and saliva. The saliva contains tylen, a ferment converting starch into sugar, and it also serves to moisten the food as it is ground up by the cheek teeth. It does not act on fat to any appreciable extent. The teeth of the rabbit are shown in figure 18, sheet 4. The incisor teeth in front, two pairs above and one pair below, I, are simply employed in grasping the food. The cheek teeth, the premolars, PM, and molars, M, behind, triturate the food by a complicated motion over each. Their crowns are flat for this purpose, with harder ridges running across them. Section 21. This grinding up of the food in the mouth invariably occurs in herbivorous animals, where there is a considerable amount of starch and comparatively little hydrocarbon in the food. By finely dividing the food, it ensures its intimate contact with the digestive ferment, tylen. In such meat-eaters as the cat and dog, where little starchy matter and much fat is taken, the saliva is, of course, of less importance, and this mastication does not occur. The cheek teeth of a dog, section 91, and more so of a cat, are sharp and used for gnawing off fragments of food which are swallowed at once. Between the incisors and premolars of a dog come the characteristic biting teeth, or canines, absent in the rabbit. Section 22. The student will probably ask why the cheek teeth, which are all similar in appearance, are divided into premolars and molars. The rabbit has a set of milk molars, a milk dentition, which are followed by the permanent teeth, just as in man. Those cheek teeth of the second set, which have predecessors in the first series, are called premolars. The ones posterior to these are the molars. Section 23. After mastication, the food is worked by the tongue and cheeks into a saliva-soaked bolus and swallowed. The passage down the esophagus is called deglutition. In the stomach it comes under the influence of the gastric juice, formed in little glandular pits in the stomach wall, the gastric, figure 8, sheet 3, and pyloric glands. This fluid is distinctly acid, its acidity being due to about one-tenth percent of a hundred of hydrochloric acid, and it therefore stops any further action of the tylen, which can only act on neutral or slightly alkaline fluids. 
the gastric juice does not act on carbohydrates or hydrocarbons to any very noticeable degree. Its essential property is the conversion of proteids into peptones, and the ferment by which this is affected is called pepsin. Milk contains a peculiar soluble proteid called cassian, which is precipitated by a special ferment, the rennet ferment, and the insoluble proteid, the curd, thus obtained is then acted on by the pepsin. In the manufacture of cheese, the rennet ferment obtained from the stomach of a calf is used to curdle the milk. Section 24. After the food has undergone digestion in the stomach, it passes into the duodenum, the U-shaped loop of intestine immediately succeeding the stomach. The duodenum is separated from the stomach by a ring-like muscular valve, the pylorus. This valve belongs to the class of muscles called sphincters, which, under ordinary circumstances, are closed, but which relax to open the circular central aperture. The valve at the anus, which retains the feces, is another instance of a sphincter. Section 25. The food at this stage is called chyme. It is an acid and soup-like fluid, acid through the influence of the gastric juice. The temperature of the animal's body is sufficiently high to keep most of the fat in the food melted and floating in oily drops. Much of the starch has been changed to sugar, and the solid proteids to soluble peptones, but many fragments of material still float unchanged. Section 26. It now meets with the bile, a greenish fluid secreted by that large and conspicuous gland, the liver. The bile is not simply a digestive secretion, like the saliva or the gastric juice, it contains matters destined to mix in, and, after a certain amount of change, to be passed out of the body with the feces. Among these substances, of which some portion is doubtless excretory, are compounds containing sulfur, the bile salts. There is also a coloring matter, biliverdin, which may possibly also be excretory. If the student will compare sections 10 and 11, he will notice that in these paragraphs no account is taken of the sulfur among the ketostases. The account is not balanced, and he will at once see that here is probably the missing item on the outgoing side. The bile, through the presence of these salts, is strongly alkaline, and so stops the action of the gastric juice, and prepares for that of the pancreas, which can act only in an alkaline medium. The fermentive action of the bile is trifling. It dissolves fats to a certain extent and is antiseptic, that is, it prevents putrefaction to which the chyme might be liable. It also seems to act as a natural purgative. Section 27. The bile, as we shall see later, is by no means the sole product of the liver. Section 28. The pancreatic juice, the secretion of the pancreas, is remarkable as acting on all the foodstuffs that have not already become soluble. It emulsifies fats, that is, it breaks the drops up into extremely small globules, forming a milky fluid, and it furthermore has a fermentive action upon them. It splits them up into fatty acids, and the soluble body glycerin. The fatty acids combine with alkaline substances, section 26, to form bodies which belong to the chemical group of soaps, and which are soluble also. The pancreatic juice also attacks any proteids that have escaped the gastric juice and converts them into peptones and any residual starch into sugar. Hence, by this stage in the duodenum, all the food constituents noted in section 17 are changed into soluble forms. There are probably three distinct ferments in the pancreatic juice acting respectively on starch, fat, and proteid, but they have not been isolated, and the term pancreatin is sometimes used to suggest the three together. Section 29. A succus entericus, a saliva-like fluid secreted by numerous small glands in the intestine's walls, Brunner's glands, Lieberkunian follicles, probably aids to an unknown but comparatively small extent in the digestive process. Section 30. The walls of the whole of the small intestine are engaged in the absorption of the soluble results of digestion. In the duodenum, especially in small processes, the villi project into the cavity, and being, like the small hairs of velvet pile, and as thickly set, give its inner coat a velvety appearance. In a villus we find, figure 9, sheet 3, a series of small blood vessels, and with it another vessel called a lacteal. The lacteals run together into larger and larger branches until they form a main trunk, the thoracic duct, which opens into the blood circulation at a point near the heart but of this we shall speak further later. They contain, after a meal, a fluid called chyle. Section 31. Emulsified fats pass into the chyle. Water and diffusible salt certainly pass into the vein. 
The course taken by the peptones is uncertain, but Professor Foster favors the chyle in the case of the rabbit. The student should read his Textbook of Physiology, Part 2, Chapter 1, Section 11, if interested in the further discussion of this question. Section 32. The processes that occur in the remaining portions of the alimentary canal are imperfectly understood. The cecum is so large in the rabbit that it must almost certainly be of considerable importance. In carnivorous animals, it may be so much reduced as to be practically absent. An important factor in the diet of the herbivorous animals, and one absent from the food of the carnivora, is that carbohydrate, the building material of all green meat, food, cellulose, and there is some ground for thinking that the cecum is probably a region of special fermentive action upon it. The pancreatic juice, it may be noted, exercises a slight digestive activity upon this substance. Section 33. Water is most largely absorbed in the large intestine, and in it the rejected, mainly insoluble, portion of the food gradually acquires its dark color and other fecal characteristics. End of The Alimentary Canal of the Rabbit Recording by Rosie The Northern Lights for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Northern Lights from Scientific American, Volume 56, Number 9, February 26, 1887. When, in 1752, Franklin succeeded through a kite sent up into a storm cloud in obtaining an electric spark at the extremity of the cord, which had been made a conductor through the rain, it was no longer possible to doubt that lightning was but an immense electric discharge between two clouds, or a discharge between a cloud and the earth. This discovery was of great importance, since it connected with the laws of physics certain phenomena which, until then, had passed for marvelous and in which nothing but supernatural and mysterious manifestations were seen. The aurora borealis, which is more difficult to understand, and which necessitates more extended scientific notions, has remained much longer unexplained. This enigmatic phenomenon was especially striking to the imagination of ancient peoples. It was regarded as an omen of inauspicious events, and the historians who describe it affirm that, at times, armies have been seen passing through the bloody heavens, and that the clash of arms has been heard. It is now known that the aurora borealis has the same origin as lightning, that it is one of the visible manifestations of atmospheric electricity, and that it is due to slow movements of that fluid, while lightning is the result of violent motions. The effects of the aurora and of the thunderbolt are absolutely different, but between them there is an intermediary that connects them, and this is heat lightning. These elementary notions are now the property of science, but the study of the aurora has hitherto been only partially outlined. Travelers and physicists have, indeed, given numerous descriptions, but it has remained to find the bonds that unite these so important phenomena in the economy of the globe, to study the causes that set them in action, to observe the correlations that they may offer, and to discuss theories. This is a labor that Mr. S. Lemstrom has been engaged in for several years, and we now propose to analyze the results published by this great Finnish physicist. The author of this important work, who has long been occupied in the study of the aurora borealis, so frequent in his country, was attached to the polar expedition made in 1868 by Nordenskold. He was led to begin a series of important observations. In 1871 he visited Finnish Lapland, and after a series of ingenious researches, constructed an apparatus that permitted him to artificially reproduce the light of the aurora, and to present science with a summary of new and incontestable facts. Mr. Lemstrom has observed a large number of aurorae, and before touching upon theoretical questions, we shall give his description of one of the phenomena that seems to him to be the completest. On the 18th of October, 1868, the steamer Sophia was nearing the coast of Norway, after battling with a furious sea for three days in succession. Quote, to the west of the horizon we remarked two strata of clouds that were clearly separated by a blue band of the heavens, crossed by a band striated with a pale yellow. It was the feeble beginning of an aurora, whose splendor was soon to surpass all the phenomena of the same kind that we had up till then observed. The edges of the upper stratum of clouds gradually lighted up, 
and we soon saw isolated flames issuing from them that sometimes rose to the zenith. Suddenly the phenomenon embraced the entire horizon. Everywhere were flames, everywhere were jets of brilliant light, yellow below, green in the center, and reddish-violet above. In an instant, all the rays united in a regular and dazzling crown, situated in the heavens to the south of the zenith. When the phenomenon reached the maximum of its intensity, it reminded us of the immense vault of a temple, with a brilliant chandelier in the center. The apparition lasted but a few minutes, but on vanishing left behind it a luminous zone between the banks of clouds. From the upper bank there continued to emanate, at short intervals, isolated rays that rose to the zenith, and there formed the fragments of a crown. The edges of the banks of clouds remained luminous, although the rays had disappeared. Unquote. According to Mr. Lemstrom, figure one gives an idea, although a feeble one, of the phenomenon at its height. It reproduces only half of the horizon, and the reader may supply the missing portion of this grand spectacle in imagination. The streams of light verging toward a common center were alternately rose-colored and pale yellow, and overlooked an immense violet zone. The rosette in the center was of a beautiful red and stood out upon a greenish-blue circle. Figure 2 represents an aurora that was observed on the 19th of November, 1871, in Finnish Lapland. At the beginning, and at thirty degrees above the horizon, it formed an arch from whence rose waves of light, and which gradually ascended. The figure shows it when it had reached about sixty degrees above the horizon. The base of the aurora was yellow, and the oblique and very brilliant rays were, slightly higher up, rosy, violet, and blue. The colors of the polar light are usually clear and bright, but never did they exhibit greater luster than on this occasion. Figure 3 gives an idea of the variety of forms that the phenomenon may affect. It represents an aurora that was observed at the Presbytery of Venere on the 16th of November, 1871. The aurora this time took on the form of a glowing red band, curved as shown in the figure. The two extremities bordered on yellow and green. There is another form of aurora frequently observed in northern countries, and that is the one that is seen to occur above clouds, and that has the appearance of a wide piece of drapery with undulating folds. As it is the form most usually represented, we shall not dwell upon it. On the contrary, we shall speak of other phenomena of the same origin, and much less known, that Mr. Lemstrom describes. It concerns those auroral lights that shine at the edges of clouds, or that form around the tops of the mountains in Spitzbergen, or in the alpine districts of Lapland. According to the Finnish observer, it would be impossible to tell by the naked eye whence this light comes, but, by means of a spectroscope, we find that it is of the same nature as the aurora. Sometimes these strange lights take on the form of flames, of but little brightness, which at short intervals rise from the crest of the mountain and suddenly vanish. Figure 4. These phenomena sometimes exhibit themselves at the level of the earth's surface or upon the roofs of houses. Finally, Mr. Lemstrom describes the diffuse light which sometimes fills the atmosphere of the polar regions, thus proving that the phenomenon shows itself from time to time in the vicinity of the earth itself. Meteors of the same nature as the light of the aurora borealis do not occur solely in the polar regions, and the author demonstrates, not without attaching much importance to it from the standpoint of the theories to which he has been led, that they are observed in other countries of the earth, in Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, the summits of the mountains are often seen illuminated by a brilliant light. This light, which occurs especially in summer, has been compared to heat lightning by scientists. Similar observations have been made in the Swiss Alps. Dr. de Saussure has seen electricity escape through all the projecting parts of objects, and the same phenomena has been observed upon the high plateaus of Mexico. Again, we may cite the fact that Brewster observed a light upon a church tower during an aurora borealis. In every country, phenomena similar to polarized light may occur. La Nature End of the Northern Lights Chinese Methods of Preserving Eggs For the LibriVox Copy Break Collection 11, Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle Chinese Methods of Preserving Eggs As much has been said of late about the mode of preserving eggs, 
it may not be uninteresting to say a few words about the chinese methods as related by a french chemist m paul champion who has lately visited that country and published a very interesting book on the ancient and modern industries of that curious people a very common method is to place eggs in a mixture of clay and water the clay hardens around the eggs and is said to preserve them good for a considerable time but another and much more elaborate method is also commonly practiced an infusion of three pounds of tea is made in boiling water and to this are added three pounds of quicklime or seven pounds when the operation is performed in winter nine pounds of sea salt and seven pounds of ashes of burnt oak finely powdered this is all well mixed together into a smooth paste by means of a wooden spatula and then each egg is covered with it by hand gloves being worn to prevent the corrosive action of the lime on the hands when the eggs are all covered with the mixture they are rolled in a mass of straw ashes and then placed in baskets with balls of rice boiled we presume to keep the eggs from touching each other about one hundred to one hundred and fifty eggs are placed in one basket in about three months the whole becomes hardened into a crust and then the eggs are sent to market the retail price of such eggs is generally less than a penny each these eggs are highly esteemed in china and always served in good houses but they have undergone a strange transformation which certainly would not recommend them to the english palates the yolk has assumed a decidedly green tinge and the white is set when broken they emit that unpleasant sulphurous smell which would certainly cause their instant banishment from our breakfast tables however the chinese are admitted even by frenchmen to be great gourmets and we can only say therefore that in questions of eating there is certainly no disputing about tastes End of Chinese Methods of Preserving Eggs From the Scientific American January 1st, 1870 Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Pyle Thank you for listening. An Eclipse in Arabia For the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. An Eclipse in Arabia Casting my eyes over the bright full moon, I perceived that an eclipse was just coming upon it. What astronomer had calculated this eclipse for Arabia? It was indeed a privilege to witness one in the bright sky that overspread the lonely mountains of Seir soon we were seated in a circle with our arabs round their watch-fire inquiring of them their views of an eclipse and explaining to them ours they appeared to have no idea of its real cause regarding it as a judgment from god a sign of a bad season and little camel feed when we undertook to explain to them the theory of the earth being round turning over every day sometimes getting between the sun and the moon they seemed to look upon us as telling very strange tales the eclipse was nearly total I gazed upon it with interest, and then eyed the strange scene around me. The wild, lonely landscape of rock and sand. The camels kneeling round the bivouac. The wild faces of the Arabs reflecting the red light of the fire around which they were seated. Their wild voices and strange, guttural language. All combined to produce an effect so startling that I felt till then I had never been thoroughly sensible of our complete separation from the civilized world. End of An Eclipse in Arabia From the Scientific American September 26th, 1846 Recording by Chris Pyle Thank you for listening. The Speaking Telegraph For the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle The Speaking Telegraph We have heretofore given accounts of the wonderful success of Professor Bell in transmitting the vibrations of the human voice by electrical means over a telegraph wire. He has lately made improvements in his method of transmission by which he dispenses with the use of the battery and substitutes the magnetoelectric plan of producing the current. The Boston Transcript describes a recent experiment with the new apparatus, 
by which conversation and singing was successfully carried on between boston and malden a distance of six miles the telephone in its present form consists of a powerful compound permanent magnet to the poles of which are attached ordinary telegraph coils of insulated wire in front of the poles surrounded by these coils of wire is placed a diaphragm of iron a mouthpiece to converge the sound upon this diaphragm substantially completes the arrangement as is well known the motion of steel or iron in front of the poles of a magnet creates a current of electricity in coils surrounding the poles of the magnet and the duration of this current of electricity coincides with the duration of the motion of the steel or iron moved or vibrated in the proximity of the magnet when the human voice causes the diaphragm to vibrate electrical undulations are induced in the coils environing the magnets precisely analogous to the undulations of the air produced by that voice these coils are connected with the line wire which may be of any length provided the insulation be good the undulations which are induced in these coils travel through the line wire and passing through the coils of an instrument of precisely similar construction at the distant station are again resolved into air undulations by the diaphragm of this instrument the experiments were as follows telephones having been connected with the private telegraphic line of the boston rubber shoe company conversation was at once commenced stationed at the boston end of the wire professor bell requested mr watson who was at the malden end to speak in loud tones with a view of enabling the entire company at once to distinguish the sounds this was so successful that a smile of mingled pleasure and surprise played on the features of those present that it however might not be supposed that loud speaking was essential to intelligibility mr bell explained that soft tones could be heard across the wires even more distinctly than loud utterances even a whisper being audible in confirmation of this statement mr watson commenced speaking in turn with each member of the company and after the efficiency of this method had been proved to the satisfaction of all he took up a newspaper and informed the assemblage that gold had closed the previous evening at new york at a hundred and five and five eighths as there were quite a number of businessmen present the effect of that this practical demonstration of the value of the telephone produced can scarcely be exaggerated other passages from the daily journals were then given and by this time the desire for conversation having become general mr watson was plied with questions such as is it thawing or freezing at malden who will be the next president etc it was remarkable that mr watson was able to distinguish between the voices at the boston end he calling at least one gentleman by name as soon as the latter commenced speaking this went on for some time until a lady at the malden end sent the company an invitation to lunch per telephone and an appropriate response was made by the same medium at length the boston company were requested to remain quiet while the lady at the other end conveyed to them the sweet strains of music the assemblage thereupon listened with rapt attention while a young lady commenced singing in the last rose of summer the effect was simply charming the sound of the voice penetrated into the boston end of the telephone with distinctness equal to that attainable in the more distant parts of a large concert room and a unanimous vote of thanks was sent by the handy little instrument which had procured for the assemblage so agreeable an hour end of the speaking telegraph from the scientific american february twenty fourth eighteen seventy seven read by chris pyle thank you for listening a ballad of evolution for the librivox coffee break collection eleven science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org in the mud of the cambrian main did our earliest ancestor dive from a shapeless albuminous grain we mortals our being derive he could split himself up into five or roll himself round like a ball for the fittest will always survive while the weakliest go to the wall as an active ascidian again fresh forms he began to contrive till he grew to a fish with a brain and brought forth a mammal alive 
With his rivals he next had to strive, To woo him a mate and a thrall. So the handsomest managed to wive, While the ugliest went to the wall. At length, as an ape he was fain, The nuts of the forest to rive, Till he took to the low-lying plain, And proceeded his fellow to knive. Thus did cannibal men first arrive, One another to swallow and maul, And the strongest continued to thrive, While the weakliest went to the wall. Envoy. Prince in our civilized hive, Now money's the measure of all, And the wealthy in coaches can drive, While the needier go to the wall. End of A Ballad of Evolution by Grant Allen Recording by Noel Badrian Prickly Pears for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Prickly Pears by Grant Allen from the North American Review, Volume 151 I am sitting on a great white Algerian rock, in the foreground a tiny mosque with a snowy dome, behind it a tall, green, prickly hedge that masks the huts of a straggling Kabyle village. How strange that here on this arid African hillside an American cactus, the common prickly pear plant, should grow on the bare and unsmitten rock to form this hedge as readily as it grows in its native Mexican desert. It is merely, like myself, a naturalized alien on this side of the Atlantic, to be sure. For the cactuses are all true American citizens by birth and training, wholly peculiar to the Western Hemisphere where they were first developed, and none of them are found truly indigenous in any part of the old world. But Africa suits the cactus tribe for all that, down to the very ground, and here, on the confines of the burning Sahara itself, the prickly pear basks on the hot soil like a genuine native to the manner born. It has adopted Algeria. The thrifty colonists introduced it first on their dry hillsides because it will grow where nothing else can thrive upon the bare rock, and cut up into blocks to disguise its prickles, it forms excellent fodder for the undiscriminating palate of the North African cow. But once introduced, it took care of itself, and now it often spreads a great deal faster than the thrifty colonists aforesaid either wished or imagined. The cactuses are very peculiar plants, as peculiar structurally as they are bizarre and grotesque in outer appearance. They have spared no pains and shrunk from no sacrifice in accommodating themselves thoroughly to their niche in nature. In the first place they have no true leaves. What look like leaves in certain jointed cactuses are really flattened and expanded stems. If this seems at first hearing a hard saying, the analogy of the common stone crops, where stem and leaf are hardly distinguishable, will help to make it a little less incredible. In other ways, too, the stone crops, or sedums as gardeners call them, throw much light upon the nature of the cactuses. All these rock-haunting or desert plants naturally get very little water, except at long intervals after occasional showers. Hence, only those can survive which form themselves, as it were, into living reservoirs to retain all the moisture they once absorb. As soon as the rain falls in their arid haunts, the roots and rootlets eagerly drink it up in a great hurry and store it away at once in the soft and spongy cellular tissue of which the main part of the plant is wholly formed. For this purpose, both in stone crops and cactuses, the stems have become fleshy and succulent, 
and being also green and leaf-like, they closely resemble true leaves. But they are covered externally with a thick skin which resists evaporation, and keeps the moisture once collected at the plant's disposal for an unlimited period. In short, the cactus does as a plant, just what the camel does as an animal. It is obvious that plants thus situated would dry up and shrivel under the sun's heat in a very short time if they had thin leaves of the ordinary type, provided with numerous pores and open spiracles. Hence it almost always happens that sandy or desert species have thick succulent stems, as we see not only in the stone crops and house leeks, but also in the glassworts and other fleshy plants so commonly found on dry sea beaches. And so necessary is this result, that in the deserts of India, where true cactuses are quite unknown, several kinds of spurges have assumed precisely the same outer shape and, having got rid of their true leaves, have developed jointed, succulent stems, exactly mimicking those of the genuine cactus. Old Anglo-Indians know them by that name alone, and poo-poo science, when it tries to tell them their cactuses are only euphorbias in disguise. In both cases, however, the leaves, though greatly reduced, have not entirely or irretrievably disappeared, they or their representatives still survive in the prickly spines with which the joints of the cactuses are so plentifully sprinkled. In order to understand this further transformation, we have only to think first of the needs of the cactus plant, and then of the analogies of the stone crops and house leeks. Desert vegetation is exposed to exceptional and peculiar dangers. Just in proportion, as there is little in the way of green stuff about to eat, does the hungry herbivore greatly desire to eat it. Hence only those plants were likely to survive in the struggle for existence which rendered themselves peculiarly unpleasant to the assaulting enemy. In the cactus, the leaves have accordingly assumed the form of sharp prickles, which in the particular species that bears the prickly pear are arranged on the leaf-like stem in a regular quincunx or five-starred pattern. How so strange a transformation comes about is readily shown in the house leeks and echeverias of our garden bowers, in which each leaf of the rosette ends in a sharp thorn, or, still better, in the glassworts of the seaside, which seem like stone crops whose fleshy leaves have converted themselves by sharpening into regular prickles. But as the cactuses have got rid of leaves, the stem has to do the work of the foliage. For this purpose it has become green and leaf-like, and it performs all the common foliar functions, that is to say, it eats for the plant, absorbing carbon from the floating carbonic acid of the air, and assimilating it in its tissues with the aid of sunlight. Thus the young and tender stems are quite leaf-like, but as they grow old they gradually assume the appearance of a trunk, partially lose their jointed look, and acquire bark of a hard, dry, brown and tree-like character. Cactuses have a wonderful knack of reproducing themselves under the most adverse conditions. If you take a cutlass and hack a cactus plant into little bits, as I have often seen a negro do in Jamaica to clear the soil, each tiny fragment that falls upon the ground will grow in time into a separate cactus bush. At first sight this seems a very marvellous and exceptional power, for sometimes the new plant grows from a most insignificant and unnoticeable scrap of the parent stem. And, indeed, in North Africa, the regular way of planting a prickly pear hedge is to chop an old cactus into tiny bits and then lay them along in a shallow trench just traced to receive them, where they straightaway grow into big bristly fences. But when one comes to look a little closer at the matter, the apparent anomaly disappears at once, for in fact what one plants is a cutting from the stem, and there is nothing more remarkable in such a cutting taking root and thriving than in slips from a rose-bush or an apple-tree growing when stuck in the ground. 
the fact is every part of every plant has in it the inherent power of reproducing an entire organism as a crystal reproduces itself in a proper solution sometimes even a bit of leaf will do as everybody who has cultivated a rock garden must have noticed in the case of sedums mere scraps of which often root and grow wherever they happen to fall by accident again in a potato we similarly cut out a piece of the tuber with an eye that is to say an undeveloped bud in it and are not at all surprised that it grows at once into a new potato vine even seeds and bulbils like those in the tiger lily are in essence merely specialized buds that fall from the mother plant so as to start in life on their own account elsewhere all that is peculiar to the cactus then is this that being a dry desert creature it is necessarily endowed with great vitality and portions of it will accordingly root and thrive under circumstances where less hardy species would dry up and wither for want of moisture it will now i suppose be quite obvious to everybody why the cactus flower seems to grow out of the end of a leaf a peculiarity especially noticeable in the pretty pink and purple epiphyllums so commonly cultivated in small conservatories in reality it grows exactly where one would expect it at the end of a stem only the stem has been flattened out so much as to deceive the eye by looking thoroughly leaf-like in the prickly pear the flowers are pale yellow and though large can hardly be considered handsome they grow quite flat on the edge of the seeming leaves in a squat and somewhat undignified attitude so far as i have observed but my opportunities for watching them have not been great they appear to be mainly fertilized by night-flying moths with a long proboscis which come out at dusk and for this reason like so many other night fertilized flowers they are pale yellow the well-known and lovely night-flowering cereus a sister cactus which is still more thoroughly nocturnal in its ways so much so that it lasts but for a single evening is pure white to catch the eyes of the moths in the tropical moonlight and it further attracts them by its strong and almost overpowering perfume which closely resembles that of tuberose stephanotis jasmine and many other white night blooming flowers in the prickly pear however the scent is very faint and is only perceptible to any extent in the grey of the evening the moths visit it of course for the sake of honey and thrusting their proboscis into its tubular depths unconsciously carry the fertilizing pollen from flower to flower as they flit from one plant to another in succession the fruit itself the prickly pear so familiar in all european and american markets follows in due course from the fertilized blossom it is a clumsy reddish and yellowish thing covered like the plant itself with those bunches of sharp hairs which have gained it its common english name the hairs are there no doubt to deter unauthorized and useless intruders the skin protects it from insect foes and small birds the pulp allures the monkeys toucans and other proper dispensers of the seed or kernel and the grains dispersed through its fleshy part are either thrown away by the animal or if swallowed are not digested owing to their tough and stony covering we thus see in this singular cactus a most perfect adaptation in every part to the circumstances of the arid and rocky soil on which it springs so perfect is the adaptation indeed that the prickly pear has long since travelled to every similar country of the civilized or semi-civilized world and is now almost as common in the barbary states and on the mediterranean shore as on its own native mexican deserts it is easy enough to make it grow the real difficulty as the small cultivators of the riviera are beginning to find out is once it gets in ever to get rid of it end of prickly pears by grant allen recording by noel badrian an account of the procuring of the smallpox by incision or inoculation 
For the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11, Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An account of the procuring of the smallpox by incision or inoculation, as it has for some time been practiced at Constantinople, being an extract of a letter from Emmanuel Timonius, M.D. S.R.S., dated Constantinople, December 1713, communicated by John Woodward, M.D. and S.R.S., number 339, page 72. The doctor observes that the Circassians, Georgians, and other Asiatics have introduced this practice of procuring the smallpox by a sort of inoculation for about forty years among the Turks and others at Constantinople, that though at first the more prudent were very cautious in the use of this practice, yet the happy success it has been found to have in thousands of subjects for these eight years past has now put it out of all suspicion and doubt, since the operation having been performed on persons of all ages, sexes, and different temperaments, and even in the worst constitution of the air, yet none have been found to die of it where at the same time it was very mortal when it seized the patient in the common way of which half the effect had died this the doctor attests from his own observation he next observes that such as have this inoculation practised on them are subject to very slight symptoms some being scarcely sensible they are ill or sick and what is valued by the fair it never leaves any scars or pits in the face the method of the operation is thus choice being made of a proper contagion the matter of the pustules is to be communicated to the person proposed to take the infection whence it has metaphorically the name of incision or inoculation for this purpose they pitch upon some boy or young lad of a sound healthy temperament that is seized with the common smallpox of the distinct not confluent kind on the twelfth or thirteenth day from the beginning of his sickness they with the needle prick the tubercules, chiefly those on the shins and hams and press out the matter coming from them into some convenient glass vessel or the like to receive it and it is proper to wash and clean the vessel first with warm water a convenient quantity of this matter being thus collected is to be stopped close and kept warm in the bosom of the person that carries it and as soon as may be brought to the place of the expecting future patient who being in a warm chamber the operator is to make several little wounds with a needle in one two or more places of the skin till some drops of blood follow and immediately drop out some drops of the matter in the glass and mix it well with the blood issuing out one drop of the matter is sufficient for each place pricked these punctures are made indifferently in any of the fleshy parts but succeed best in the muscles of the arm or radius the needle is to be a three-edged surgeon's needle it may likewise be performed with a lancet the custom is to run the needle transverse and rip up the skin a little that there may be a convenient dividing of the part and the mixing of the matter with the blood more easily performed which is done either with a blunt style or an ear picker the wound is covered with half a walnut shell or the light concave vessel and bound over that the matter be not rubbed off by the clothes the patient is to be careful of his diet in this place the custom is to abstain wholly from flesh and broth for three or four weeks this operation is performed either in the beginning of the winter or in the spring some for caution order the matter to be brought from the sick by a third person lest any infection should be conveyed by the clothes of the operator but this is not material as to the process of this matter in respect to the idiosyncrasy the smallpox begins to appear sooner in some than in others in some with greater in others with less symptoms but with happy success in all in this place the efflorescence commonly begins at the end of the seventh day which seems to favor the doctrine of crises it was observed in a year when the common smallpox was very mortal that those by incision were also attended with greater symptoms of fifty persons who had the incision made on them almost in the same day four were found in whom the eruption was too sudden the tubercles more and symptoms worse there was some suspicion that these four had caught the common smallpox before the incision was made it is enough for our present purpose that there was not one but recovered after the incision in those four the smallpox came near the confluent kind at other times the inoculated are distinct few and scattered commonly ten or twenty break out here and there one has but two or three few have one hundred 
there are some in whom no pustule rises but in the places where the incision was made which swell up into purulent tubercles yet these have never had the smallpox afterwards in their whole lives though they have cohabitated with persons having it it is to be noted that a no small quantity of matter runs for several days from the place of the incision the pox arising from this operation are dried up in a short time and fall off partly in thin skins and partly contrary to the common sort vanish by an insensible wasting the matter is hardly a thick pus as in the common but a thinner kind of sanies whence they rarely pit except at the place of the incision where the cicatrices left are not to be worn out by time and whose matter comes near the nature of pus if an apostem breaks out on any which infants are most subject to yet there is nothing to be feared for it is safely healed by suppuration if any other symptom happens it is easily cured by the common remedies observe they scarcely ever make use of the matter of the inoculated pox for a new incision if this inoculation be made on persons who have before had the smallpox they find no alteration and the places pricked presently dry up except in an ill habit of body where possibly a slight inflammation and exulceration may happen for a few days to this time he says i have known but one boy on whom the operation was performed and yet he had not the smallpox but without any mischief and some months after catching the common sort he did very well it is to be observed that the places of the incision did not swell i suspect this child prevented the insertion of the matter for he struggled very much under the operation and there wanted help to hold him still the matter to be inserted will keep in the glass very well for twelve hours i have never he adds observed any mischievous accident from this incision hitherto and although such reports have been sometimes spread among the vulgar yet having gone on purpose to the houses whence such rumours have arisen i have found the whole to be absolutely false it is now eight years since i have been an eye-witness of these operations and to give a greater proof of the sedulity i have used in this disquisition i shall relate two histories in a certain family a boy of three years old was afflicted with the falling sickness the king's evil an hereditary pox and a long marasmus the parents were desirous to have the incision made upon him the smallpox were thrown off with ease about the fortieth day he died of his marasmus in another family a girl of three years old was troubled with the like fits strumus attended with an hereditary lues and labouring under a coliquative looseness for three months the operation was performed on this child she came off very well of the smallpox which was all over the fifteenth day on the thirty-second she died of her looseness which had never left her the whole time but it is true i never maintain the inoculation as a panacea or a cure for all diseases nor do i think it proper to be attempted on persons like to die then follows a long aetiologia respecting the manner in which this author supposes the various contagion to act upon the human body he supposes it to act upon the mass of blood after the manner of a ferment or leaven and that all the symptoms which take place in the natural or inoculated smallpox are to be accounted for in the first instance from the commotion excited in the blood and thence upon the constitution at large in the next place from the defecation or separation of the vitiated particles from the healthy etc etc respecting a theory now universally exploded it cannot be necessary to enter into further particulars End of An Account of the Procuring of the Smallpox by Incision or Inoculation Communicated by John Woodward, M.D. and S.R.S. Scientific Wooing for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Newgate Novelist I was a youth of studious mind, fair science was my mistress kind, and held me with attraction chemic. No germs of love attacked my heart, secured as by Pasteurian art against that fatal epidemic. For when my daily task was o'er, I dreamed of H2SO4, while stealing through my slumbers placid came iodine with violet fumes, and sulphur with its yellow blooms, and whiffs of hydrochloric acid. 
my daily visions thoughts and schemes with wildest hope illumed my dreams the daring dreams of trustful twenty i might accomplish my desire and set the river thames on fire if but potassium were in plenty alas that yearning so sublime should all be blasted in their prime by hazel eyes and lips vermilion ye gods restore the halcyon days while yet i walked in wisdom's ways and knew not marry maud trevelyan yet nay the sacrilegious prayer was not mine own o fairest fair thee dear one will i ever cherish thy worshipped image shall remain in the grey thought-cells of my brain until their form and function perish away with books away with cram for intermediate exam away with every college duty though once agnostic to the core a virgin saint i now adore and swear belief in love and beauty yet when i meet her tranquil gaze i dare not plead i dare not praise like other men with other lasses she's never kind she's never coy she treats me simply as a boy and asks me how i like my classes i covet not her golden dower yet surely love's attractive power directly as the mass must vary but ah inversely as the square of distance shall i ever dare to cross the gulf and gain my marry so chill she seems and yet she might welcome with radiant heat and light my courtship if i once began it for is not e'en the palest star that gleams so coldly from afar a sun to some revolving planet my mary be a solar sphere envy no comet's mad career no arid airless lunar crescent oh for a spectroscope to show that in thy gentle eyes doth glow love's vapour pure and incandescent bright fancy can i fail to please if with similitudes like these i lure the maid to sweet communion my suit with optics well begun by magnetism shall be won and closed at last in chemic union at this i'll aim for this i'll toil and this i'll reach i will by boyle by avogadro and by davy when every science lends a trope to feed my love to fire my hope her maiden pride must cry peccavi i'll sing a deep darwinian lay of little birds with plumage gay who solved by courtship life's enigma i'll teach her how the wild flowers love and why the trembling stamens move and how the anthers kiss the stigma or mathematically true with rigorous logic will i woo and not a word i'll say at random till urged by syllogistic stress she falter forth a tearful yes a sweet quod erat demonstrandum end of scientific wooing by constance naden fermentation for the LibriVox Coffee Book Collection 11. Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Fermentation from General Science by Bertha M. Clark. While baking powder is universally used for biscuits and cake, it is seldom, if ever, used for bread because it does not furnish sufficient gas to lighten the tough heavy mass of bread dough then too most people prefer the taste of yeast raised bread there is a reason for this widespread preference but to understand it we must go somewhat far afield and must study not only the bread of today but the bread of antiquity and the wines as well if grapes are crushed they yield a liquid which tastes like the grapes but if the liquid is allowed to stand in a warm place it loses its original character and begins to ferment becoming in the course of a few weeks a strongly intoxicating drink this is true not only of grape juice but also of the juice of all other sweet fruits apple juice ferments to cider currant juice to currant wine etc this phenomenon of fermentation is known to practically all races of men and there is scarcely a savage tribe without some kind of fermented drink in the tropics the fermented juice of the palm tree serves for wine in the desert regions the fermented juice of the century plant and in still other regions the root of the ginger plant is pressed into service the fermentation which occurs in bread making is similar to that which is responsible for the transformation of plant juices into intoxicating drinks 
The former process is not so old, however, since the use of alcoholic beverages dates back to the very dawn of history, and the authentic record of raised or leavened bread is but little more than three thousand years old. THE BREAD OF ANTIQUITY the original method of bread-making, and the method employed by savage tribes of today, is to mix crushed grain and water until a paste is formed, and then to bake this over a camp-fire. The result is a hard, compact substance known as unleavened bread. A considerable improvement over this tasteless mass is self-raised bread. If dough is left standing in a warm place a number of hours, it swells up with gas and becomes porous, and when baked is less compact and hard than the savage bread. Exposure to air and warmth brings about changes in dough as well as in fruit juices, and alters the character of the dough and the bread made from it. Bread made in this way would not seem palatable to civilized man of the present day, accustomed as he is to delicious bread made light and porous by yeast but to the ancients the least softening and lightening was welcome and self-fermented bread therefore supplanted the original unleavened bread soon it was discovered that a pinch of this fermented dough acted as a starter on a fresh batch of dough hence a little of the fermented dough was carefully saved from a batch and when the next bread was made the fermented dough or leaven was worked into the fresh dough and served to raise the mass more quickly and effectively than mere exposure to air and warmth could do in the same length of time. This use of leaven for raising bread has been practised for ages. Grape juice mixed with millet ferments quickly and strongly, and the Romans learnt to use this mixture for bread raising, kneading a very small amount of it through the dough. The Cause of Fermentation Although alcoholic fermentation and the fermentation which goes on in raising dough were known and utilized for many years, the cause of the phenomenon was a sealed book until the nineteenth century. About that time it was discovered, through the use of the microscope, that fermenting liquids contained an army of minute plant organisms which not only live there but which actually grow and multiply within the liquid. For growth and multiplication, food is necessary, and this the tiny plants get in abundance from the fruit juices. They feed upon the sugary matter, and as they feed, they ferment it, changing it into carbon dioxide and alcohol. The carbon dioxide in the form of small bubbles passes off from the fermenting mass, while the alcohol remains in the liquid, giving the stimulating effect desired by imbibers of alcoholic drinks. The unknown strange organisms were called yeast, and they were the starting point of the yeast cakes and yeast brews manufactured today on a large scale, not only for bread-making, but for the commercial production of beer, ale, porter, and other intoxicating drinks. The grains, rye, corn, rice, wheat, from which meal is made, contain only a small quantity of sugar, but on the other hand they contain a large quantity of starch, which is easily convertible into sugar. Upon this the tiny yeast plants in the dough feed, and as in the case of the wines, ferment the sugar, producing carbon dioxide and alcohol. The dough is thick and sticky, and the gas bubbles expand it into a spongy mass. The tiny yeast plants multiply and continue to make alcohol and gas, and in consequence the dough becomes lighter and lighter. When it has risen sufficiently, it is kneaded and placed in an oven. The heat of the oven soon kills the yeast plants and drives the alcohol out of the bread. At the same time, it expands the imprisoned gas bubbles and causes them to lighten and swell the bread still more. Meanwhile, the dough has become stiff enough to support itself. The result of the fermentation is a light, spongy loaf. Where does yeast come from? The microscopic plants which we call yeast are widely distributed in the air and float around there until chance brings them in contact with a substance favourable to their growth, such as fruit juices and moist warm batter. Under the favourable conditions of abundant moisture, heat and food, they grow and multiply rapidly and cause the phenomenon of fermentation. 
wild yeast settles on the skin of grapes and apples but since it does not have access to the fruit juices within it remains inactive very much as a seed does before it is planted but when the fruit is crushed the yeast plants get into the juice and feeding on it grow and multiply the stray yeast plants which get into the syrup are relatively few and hence fermentation is slow it requires several weeks for current wine to ferment and several months for the juice of grapes to be converted into wine stray yeast finds a favorable soil for growth in the warmth and moisture of a batter but although the number of these stray plants is very large it is insufficient to cause rapid fermentation and if we depended upon wild yeast for bread raising the result would not be to our liking when our remote ancestors saved a pinch of dough as leaven for the next baking they were actually cultivating yeast although they did not know it the reserved portions served as a favorable breeding place to the yeast plants within it they grew and reproduced amazingly and became so numerous that the small mass of old dough in which they were gathered served to leaven the entire batch at the next baking as soon as man learnt that yeast plants caused fermentation in liquors and bread he realized that it would be to his advantage to cultivate yeast and to add it to bread and to plant juices rather than to depend upon accidental and slow fermentation from wild yeast shortly after the discovery of yeast in the nineteenth century man commenced his attempt to cultivate the tiny organisms their microscopic size added greatly to his trouble and it was only after years of careful and tedious investigation that he was able to perfect the commercial yeast cakes and yeast brews universally used by bakers and brewers the well-known compressed yeast cake is simply a mass of live and vigorous yeast plants embedded in a soft soggy material and ready to grow and multiply as soon as they are placed under proper conditions of heat moisture and food seeds which remain on our shelves do not germinate but those which are planted in the soil do so it is with the yeast plants while in the cake they are as lifeless as the seed when placed in dough or fruit juice or grain water they grow and multiply and cause fermentation end of fermentation by bertha m clark Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Astronomer for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Newgate Novelist. The Astronomer by Constance Naden. White, cold, and sacred is my chosen home, a seat for gods, a mount divine, and from the height of this eternal dome, sky, sea, and earth are mine. All these I love, but only heaven is near, only the tranquil stars I know, I see the map of earth, but never hear life's tumult far below. Bright hieroglyphs I read in heaven's book, but oft, with eyes too dim for these, in half-regretful ignorance I look on common fields and trees scant fare for wife and child the fisher gains from yon broad belt of lucent grey rude peasants till those green and golden plains am i more wise than they oh far less glad and yet could i descend and breathe the lowland air again how should i find a brother or a friend mid earth contented men though while i sat beside my household fire some dear dear hand should clasp my own must i not pine with homesick sharp desire for this my mountain throne i were impatient of the narrowed skies yes even of the clasping hand and she sad gazing in my restless eyes would haply understand and know my fevered yearning to depart to dwell once more alone and free well might i love yet needs must break the heart that puts its trust in me yet hope and ecstasy desert me not but coldly shine like moonlit snows this earthly dream renounced yet unforgot to heavenly splendour grows for oft when sleep has lulled a brain o'erwrought strange light across my brow is thrown the glorious incarnation of my thought urania stands alone she passionless of no fond woman born towers awful in her virgin grace calmly she smiles the first faint rose of morn flushes her sovereign face her atmosphere of white unswerving rays athwart the fading moonlight swims 
rare vapour like a comet's luminous haze floats round her argent limbs her clear celestial eyes look deep in mine her brow and breast gleam icy pure she whispers be thy heart my secret shrine so shall thy strength endure so shall thy godlike wisdom soar above all rainbow hues of grief or mirth and i will love thee as the stars do love even thy distant earth then her eyes lighten then her voice thrills clear but life and death contend in me and still she speaks but now i may not hear shines but i dare not see how shall immortal splendour wed the gaze of man who knows but that which seems whose sight were blinded if the sun should blaze with unrefracted beams void were the earth and formless if arrayed in purity of perfect white all things are clear by colour and by shade glorious with lack of light but what is she whose beauty makes me blind whose voice is like the voice of fate what save a lustrous mirage of the mind my slave whom i create yet from such dear illusions wisdom springs though these may fade she shall not die in fabled forms of heroes and of kings e'en yet we map the sky slow conquering truth loves well the joyous noon but silent midnight gave her birth the cone of darkness that o'ershades the moon revealed the orbit earth man knelt to constellated sun supreme but as he knelt to golden clods nor till he ceased to worship e'er could dream the greatness of his gods he wove for all the planets as they passed strange legends wrought of love and youth while o'er the poet's soul was vaguely cast a shadow of the truth kinsman is he to all the stars that burn mirrored in eyes of sleepless awe and from his brotherhood with dust may learn the heaven's living law nor shall the essences of truth and might sleep ever in thick darkness furled yon dim horizon bounds my present sight not the eternal world when the skies glitter when the earth is cold in some divine and voiceless hour the heavens vanish and mine eyes behold the elemental power now has the breath of god my being thrilled within around his word i hear for all the universe my heart is filled with love that casts out fear in one deep gaze to concentrate the whole of that which was is now shall be to feel it like the thought of mine own soul such power is given to me my sight love strengthened time and space controls no more are force and will at strife beyond the sun i pass around me rolls infinite circled life this realm where he his destined orbit keeps this world of planet ruling spheres borne onward with its pleiad centre sweeps through unimagined years in suns that shining for some nobler race their twin-born light commingled give and through black depths of interstellar space a boundless life i live to me the orbs their fiery past reveal with each minutest change designed till in this harmony of worlds i feel the future of mankind when each shall aid the universal plan when every deed its end shall serve when e'en the wildest comet thought of man shall flash in ordered curve when mighty souls that burst all prison bars shall their diviner selves obey when man shall hold communion with the stars constant and calm as they when every heart shall perfect peace attain and every mind celestial scope such were mine own save for this hungry pain this lack of earth-born hope i were content though palsied sightless dumb if blasting toil-worn brain and eye the heights and depths of human joy to come shone clear before i die end of the astronomer by constance naden The Pancreas of the Tasmanian Devil Extracted from The Liver Spleen Pancreas Peritoneal Relations and Biliary Systems in Monotremes and Marsupials by William Colin Mackenzie Published in 1918 For the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection Number 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles The Pancreas of the Tasmanian Devil by William Colin Mackenzie Pancreatic tissue may be traced along the common duct of the right extremity of the gastrohepatic omentum, up to the portal fissure. Only a relatively small amount is found in the back part of the dorsal mesentery, corresponding to the mesoduodenum. I have never been able to trace it in relation to the duodenal wall and about the common duct after being joined by the pancreatic duct, so that the amount in this animal in the region of the intestine corresponding to the duodenal loop of other marsupials may be regarded as insignificant. The Tasmanian devil has a well-developed great omentum, 
which runs from the pyloric region along the great curve of the stomach. It is independent of the dorsal mesentery, by which we mean mesoduodenum, mesentery, and mesocolon, so that no portion of intestine is included in the lesser sac. If we throw the great omentum and stomach up onto the chest wall, we see dorsally about the root of the mesentery a well-defined piece of pancreas, from which strands are traced onto the great omentum. Traced to the left of the mesenteric root, the pancreas passes out to the spleen, but beyond sending several processes onto the great omentum, it is really outside the lesser sac, forming its lower boundary. In some specimens, no pancreas can be traced in relation to the body or the right anterior process of the spleen. In others, however, a piece may be found in the lesser sac related to the body of the spleen, that is, extending towards the fundus. The main pancreatic tissue diffuses itself over the membrane, the lienomescolic or left lateral fold, extending between the short left process of the spleen and the dorsal wall close to the attachment of the mesocolon. This membrane is nearly 10 cm long, but pancreatic tissue does not extend nearer than about 2 cm to the posterior or dorsal attachment. The membrane is somewhat triangular in shape, extending above from the root of the mesentery out along the lower part of the lesser sac to the left posterior or dorsal short process of the spleen to which it is attached. This basal portion measures about 5 to 6 cm. Its right margin is, as stated, attached at dorsal wall to the left of the attachment of the mesocolon, while the left margin is free. End of The Pancreas of the Tasmanian Devil by William Colin Mackenzie. Recording by Son of the Exiles. How Trees Grow and Multiply for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11, Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. How Trees Grow and Multiply by Charles Lathrop Pack from the School Book of Forestry. The trees of the forest grow by forming new layers of wood directly under the bark. Trees are held upright in the soil by means of roots which reach to a depth of many feet where the soil is loose and porous. These roots are the supports of the tree. They hold it rigidly in position. They also supply the tree with food. Through delicate hairs on the roots, they absorb soil moisture and plant food from the earth and pass them along to the tree. The body of the tree acts as a passageway through which the food and drink are conveyed to the top or crown. The crown is the place where the food is digested and the regeneration of trees affected. The leaves contain a material known as chlorophyll, which in the presence of light and heat changes mineral substances into plant food. Chlorophyll gives the leaves their green color. The cells of the plant that are rich in chlorophyll have the power to convert carbonic acid gas into carbon and oxygen. These cells combine the carbon and the soil water into chemical mixtures which are partially digested when they reach the crown of the tree. The water containing salts which is gathered by the roots is brought up to the leaves. Here it combines with the carbonic acid gas taken from the air. Under the action of chlorophyll and sunlight, these substances are split up, the carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen being combined into plant food. It is either used immediately or stored away for a future emergency. Trees breathe somewhat like human beings. They take in oxygen and give off carbonic acid gas. The air enters the tree through the leaves and small openings in the bark, which are easily seen in such trees as the cherry and birch. Trees breathe constantly, but they digest and assimilate food only during the day and in the presence of light. In the process of digestion and assimilation they give off oxygen in abundance, but they retain most of the carbonic acid gas, which is a plant food, and whatever part of it is not used immediately is stored up by the tree and used for its growth and development. Trees also give off their excess moisture through the leaves and bark, otherwise they would become waterlogged during periods when the water is rising rapidly from the roots. After the first year, trees grow by increasing the thickness of their older buds. Increase in height and density of crown cover is due to the development of the younger twigs. New growth on the tree is spread evenly between the wood and bark over the entire body of the plant. This process of wood production resembles a factory enterprise in which three layers of material are engaged. 
In the first two of these delicate tissues, the wood is actually made. The inner side of the middle layer produces new wood, while the outer side grows bark. The third layer is responsible for the production of the tough outer bark. Year after year, new layers of wood are formed around the first layers. This first layer finally develops into heartwood, which, so far as growth is concerned, is dead material. Its cells are blocked up and prevent the flow of sap. It aids in supporting the tree. The living sapwood surrounds the heartwood. Each year, one ring of this sapwood develops. This process of growth may continue until the annual layers amount to 50 or 100 or more, according to the life of the tree. One can tell the age of a tree by counting the number of annual rings. Sometimes, because of the interruption of normal growth, two false rings may be produced instead of a single true ring. However, such blemishes are easy for the trained eye to recognize. Heartwood does not occur in all varieties of trees. In some cases, where both heartwood and sapwood appear, it is difficult to distinguish between them as their colors are so nearly alike. Because it takes up so much moisture and plant food, sapwood rots much more quickly than heartwood. The sapwood really acts as a pipeline to carry water from the roots to the top of the tree. In some of our largest trees, the moisture is raised as high as 300 feet or more through the sapwood. Strange though it may seem, trees fight with each other for a place in the sunlight. Sprightly trees that shoot skyward at a swift pace are the ones that develop into the monarchs of the forest. They excel their mates in growth because at all times they are exposed to plenty of light. The less fortunate trees, that are more stocky and sturdy, and less speedy in their climb toward the sky, are killed out in a large number each year. The weaker, spindly trees of the forest, which are slow growers, often are smothered out by the more vigorous trees. Some trees are able to grow in the shade. They develop near or under the large trees of the forest. When the giants of the woodland die, these smaller trees, which previously were shaded, develop rapidly as a result of their freedom from suppression. In many cases, they grow almost as large and high as the huge trees that they replace. In our eastern forests, the hemlock often follows the white pine in this way. Spruce trees may live for many years in dense shade. Then, finally, when they have access to plenty of light, they may develop into sturdy trees. A tree that is a pygmy in one locality may rank as a giant in another region due to different conditions of growth and climate. For example, the canoe birch at its northern limit is a runt. It never grows higher than a few feet above the ground. Under the most favorable conditions in Florida, where this species thrives, such trees often tower to a height of 125 feet. In sheltered regions, the seeds of trees may fall, sprout, and take root close to their parent trees. As a rule, the wind plays a prominent part in distributing seed in every direction of the country. Pine and fir seeds are equipped with wings like those of a bird or an airplane. They enable the seeds to fly long distances on the wind before they drop to the ground and are covered with leaves. Maple seeds fly by means of double-winged sails, which carry them far afield before they settle. Ash seeds have peculiar appendages which act like a skate sail in transporting them to distant sections. Cottonwood seeds have downy wings, which aid their flight, while basswood seeds are distributed over the country by means of parachute-like wings. The pods of the locust tree fall on the frozen ground or snow crust and are blown long distances from their source. On the other hand, oak, hickory, and chestnut trees produce heavy seeds which generally remain where they fall. Squirrels are the most industrious foresters in the animal world. Each year they bury great quantities of tree seeds in hordes or caches hidden away in hollow logs or in the moss and leaves of the forest floor. Birds also scatter tree seed here, there, and everywhere over the forest and the surrounding country. Running streams and rivers carry seeds uninjured for many miles and finally deposit them in places where they sprout and grow into trees. Many seeds are carried by the ocean currents to distant foreign shores. The decay of leaves and woodland vegetation forms rich and fertile soils in the forests, in which conditions are favorable for the development of new tree growth. When living tree seeds are exposed to proper amounts of moisture, warmth, and air in a fertile soil, they will sprout and grow. A root develops which pushes its way down into the soil, while the leaf bud of the plant, which springs from the other end of the seed, works its way upward toward the light and air. This leafy part of the seed finally forms the stem of the tree, but trees may produce plenty of seed and yet fail to maintain their proper proportion in the forest. This results because much of the seed is unsound. 
Even where a satisfactory supply of sound fertile seed is produced, it does not follow that the trees of that variety will be maintained in the forest, as the seed supply may be scattered in unfavorable positions for germination. Millions of little seedlings, however, start to grow in the forest each year, but only a small number survive and become large trees. This is because so many of the seedlings are destroyed by forest fires, cattle and sheep grazing, unfavorable soil and weather conditions, and many other causes. Beech and chestnut trees and others of the broadleaf type reproduce by means of sprouts as well as by seed. Generally, the young stumps of broadleaf trees produce more sprouts than the stumps of older trees, which have stood for some time. Among the cone-bearing trees, reproduction by sprouts is rare. The redwood of California is one of the few exceptions. The pitch pine of the eastern states produces many sprouts, few of which live and develop into marketable timber. When the trees are grown in nurseries, the practice is to sow the seed in special beds filled with rich soil. Lath screens are used as shade. They protect the young seedlings from the sun just as the parent trees would do in the forest. The seed beds are kept well cultivated and free of weeds so that the seedlings may have the best opportunities for rapid growth. Generally, the seeds are sown in the spring between March and May. Such seeds as the elms and soft maples which ripen in the early summer are sown as soon as possible after they are gathered. Practical tests have shown that thick sowings of tree seeds give the best results. There is little danger of weeds smothering out the seedlings under such conditions. After the seed is germinated, the beds may be thinned so that the seedlings will have more room to develop. During the fall of the same year, or in the following spring, the seedlings should be transplanted to nursery rows. Thereafter, it is customary to transplant the young trees at least once again during damp weather. When the trees finally are robust and vigorous, and have reached the age of two to five years, they are dug up carefully and set out permanently. The usual practice is to keep the seedlings one year in the seed bed and two years in the nursery rows before they are set out. Whether the transplanting should take place during the spring or fall depends largely on the climate and geography of the locality. Practical experience is the best guide in such matters. Some farmers and landowners are now interested in setting out hardwood forests for commercial purposes. If they do not wish to purchase their seedlings from a reliable nurseryman, they can grow them from carefully selected seed planted in well-prepared seed beds. The popular practice is to sow the seed in drills about two to three feet apart so that horses may be used for cultivation. The seeds are sown to a depth of two to three times their thickness. They are placed close enough to the drill so that from 12 to 15 seedlings to the linear foot result. In order to hasten the sprouting of the seeds, some planters soak them in cold water for several days before sowing. In the case of such hard-coated seed as the black locust or honey locust, it is best to soak them in hot water before planting. End of How Trees Grow and Multiply by Charles Lathrop Pack Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia The Gigantic Moa Bird for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11 Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Hihi Kitty The Gigantic Moa Bird Author Unknown Editors William and Robert Chambers from Chambers's Journal of Popular Literature, Science and Art, number 716, Saturday, September 15th, 1877. The extinction of many animals that are known to have formerly existed on the earth is a subject which cannot very easily be explained, while the number of them is greater than at first sight would be supposed. Various species no doubt undergo gradual extinction by changes which deprive them of their accustomed food, but others seem to die out from unknown causes. During the historic period, a considerable number of animals have been swept off the British islands, among which are the bear, the wolf, the Irish elk, etc. In America, during the comparatively short period of its history, Various species have vanished, and others are following them. The beaver, formerly so generally spread over the whole of that country, is now only to be found in remote regions. 
the deer and the moose are disappearing in the same manner the bison is very much diminished in numbers and must ere long be extirpated the mastodon a creature of enormous bulk has totally disappeared although along with the skeletons of them which have been discovered there are evidences of their having lived on food derived from plants which are still existing in other parts of the world the dodo and the moa have perished within the last few centuries and the apteryx is undergoing the same fate the moa or dinorus was a huge bird of which the remains are plentifully found in new zealand within recent historic times this colony was tenanted to the almost entire exclusion of mammalia by countless numbers of gigantic wingless birds of various genera and species the dinoris gigantea the largest attaining a size nearly thrice that of a full-grown ostrich from traditions which are current among the maoris they were fat stupid indolent birds living in forests and feeding on vegetables while the name moa seems to have been given to them from their peculiar cry since remains have been found in great plenty the investigation of the singular bird is of the greatest interest to students of natural history it is to the rev richard taylor that the first discovery of moa remains is due which he thus describes in the beginning of eighteen thirty nine i took my first journey in new zealand to poverty bay with the rev w williams bishop of waiapu when we reached waiapu near the east cape we took up our abode in a native house and there i noticed the fragment of a large bone stuck in the ceiling i took it down supposing at first that it was human but when i saw its cancellated structure i handed it over to my companion who had been brought up to the medical profession asking him if he did not think it was a bird's bone he laughed at the idea and said what kind of bird could there be to have so large a bone i pointed out its structure and when the natives came requested him to ask them what it belonged to they said it was a bone of the tarepo a very large bird that lived on top of the hikurangi the highest mountain on the east coast and that they made their largest fish hooks from its bones i then inquired whether the bird was still to be met with and was told that there was one of an immense size which lived in a cave and was guarded by a large lizard and that the bird was always standing on one leg the chief readily gave me the bone for a little tobacco and i afterwards sent it to professor owen by sir everard home in eighteen thirty nine and i think i may justly claim to have been the first discoverer of the moa mr taylor continued his inquiries among the natives who informed him that the moa was quite as large as a horse that these birds had nests made of the refuse of fern root on which they fed and that they used to conceal themselves in the veronica thickets from which by setting them on fire the natives drove them out and killed them hence originated the maori saying the veronica was the tree which roasted the moa the natives further mentioned that when a moa hunt was to take place notice was given inviting all to the batu the party then spread out to enclose as large a space as possible and drive the birds from their haunts then gradually contracting the line as they approached some lake they at last rushed forward with loud yells and drove the frightened birds into the water where they could be easily approached in canoes and dispatched without their being able to make any resistance these moa hunts must thus have been very destructive as from the number of men employed and the traces of long lines of ovens in which the natives cooked the birds and the large quantity of eggshells found on the western shores of new zealand a clear proof is given that these birds were eagerly sought for and feasted upon 
thus the poor moas had very little chance of continuing their race from a very interesting communication of the rev w williams dated seventeenth may eighteen seventy two it would appear that the moa may not yet be entirely extirpated within the last few days he remarks i have obtained a piece of information worthy of notice happening to speak to an american about these bones he told me that the bird is still in existence in the neighborhood of cloudy bay in cook strait he said that the natives there had mentioned to an englishman belonging to a whaling party that there was a bird of extraordinary size to be seen only at night on the side of a hill near the place and that he with a native and a second englishman went to the spot that after waiting some time they saw the creature at a little distance which they described as being about fourteen or sixteen feet high one of the men proposed to go nearer and shoot but his companion was so exceedingly terrified or perhaps both of them that they were satisfied with looking at the bird when after a little time it took the alarm and strode off up the side of the mountain in the greymouth weekly argus published in new zealand in eighteen seventy six there appeared a letter signed r k m smythe browning's pass otago describing in a very detailed manner the capture of two living mowers a female eight feet high and a young one three feet shorter the writer finishes his account of their capture by remarking that he has little doubt that he will be able to bring them both alive to Christchurch. It is therefore to be hoped that living representatives of the genus Dinorus still survive. Feathers of the bird have been also found in a state of preservation sufficiently good to show that they possessed an aftershaft of a large size and at the same time tradition and the condition in which the bones are found retaining much of their animal matter tend to show how lately the bird formed part of the existing fauna of the country if the letter be genuine it cannot be long before ornithologists of whom there are several of no mean repute in new zealand will be able to satisfy themselves on the subject an additional reason for supposing that these magnificent birds existed not long ago is found in the fact that specimens of their eggs have been preserved in the volcanic sand of new zealand mr walter mantell found a gigantic egg of the magnitude of which he gives us a familiar idea by saying that his head would have been just large enough to have served as an egg cup for it this egg must have been one of a dinorus or a palapteryx and although its dimensions are considerably greater than the egg of the ostrich still it is smaller than might have been expected from a bird from twelve to fourteen feet high it is well known that the egg of the new zealand apteryx to which the moa bears a very close affinity is one of dimensions that are quite surprising in proportion to the bulk of the bird the apteryx is about as big as a turkey standing two feet in height but its egg measures four inches ten lines by three inches two lines in the respective diameters to bear the same ratio to the bird as this the egg of the dinoris gigantea would be one of the incredible length of two feet and a half by a breadth of one and three quarters in the museum at york there is a complete skeleton of a moa which besides feathers has the integuments of the feet partly preserved from which it is evident that the toes were covered with small hexagonal scales a specimen has also been sent by dr haast of new zealand to professor milne edwards which is to be seen in the museum of natural history at paris End of the gigantic moa bird author unknown editors william and robert chambers that a beaver to escape the hunter bites off his testicles or stones
for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11, Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wallace. Of the Beaver by Sir Thomas Brown, Chapter 4 of the Third Book of Diverse Popular and Received Tenants Concerning Animals which examined prove either false or dubious, in his Pseudodoxia Epidemica. Of the Beaver That a beaver, to escape the hunter, bites off his testicles or stones, is a tenet very ancient, and hath had thereby advantage of propagation. For the same we find in the hieroglyphics of the Egyptians, in the apologue of Aesop, an author of great antiquity who lived in the beginning of the Persian monarchy and in the time of Cyrus. The same is touched by Aristotle in his ethics, but seriously delivered by Aelian, Pliny, and Solinus. The same we meet with in Juvenal, who by an handsome and metrical expression more welcomely engrafts it in our junior memories. Imitatus castora, qui se oinucum ipse facit, Cupien se varere damno testiculorum, adeo medicatum interlegit inguen. It hath been propagated by emblems, and some have been so bad grammarians, as to be received by the name, deriving castor a castrando, whereas the proper Latin word is fiber, and castor but borrowed from the Greek, so called quasi gastor, that is, animal ventricosum, from his swaggy and prominent belly. Herein, therefore, to speak compendiously, we first presume to affirm that from strict inquiry we cannot maintain the evulsion or biting off any parts, and this is declarable from the best and most professed writers. For though some have made use hereof in a moral or tropical way, yet have the professed discourses by silence deserted or by experience rejected this assertion. Thus was it, in ancient times, discovered and experimentally refuted by one Cestius, a physician, as it stands related by Pliny, by Dioscorides, who plainly affirms that this tradition is false, by the discoveries of modern authors who have expressly discoursed hereon, as Aldrovandus, Matthiolus, Gesneros, Bellonius, by Olaus Magnus, Peter Martyr, and others who have described the manner of their venations in America they generally omitting this way of their escape, and have delivered several other by which they are daily taken. The original of this conceit was probably hieroglyphical, which after became mythological unto the Greeks, and so set down by Aesop, and by process of tradition stole into a total verity, which was but partially true, that is, in its covert sense and morality. Now, why they placed this invention upon the beaver, beside the medicable and merchantable commodity of castorium, or parts conceived to be bitten away, might be the sagacity and wisdom of that animal, which from the works it performs, and especially its artifice in building, is very strange, and surely not to be matched by any other. Omitted by Plutarch de Soletia Animalium, but might have much advantaged the drift of that discourse. If, therefore, any affirm a wise man should demean himself like the beaver, who to escape with his life contemneth the loss of his genitals, that is, in case of extremity, not strictly to endeavour the preservation of all, but to sit down in the enjoyment of the greater good, though with the detriment and hazard of the lesser, we may hereby apprehend a real and useful truth. In this latitude of belief, we are content to receive the fable of Hippomanes, who redeemed his life with the loss of a golden ball. And whether true or false, we reject not the tragedy of Absyrtus and the dispersion of his members by Medea to perplex the pursuit of her father. But if any shall positively affirm this act, and cannot believe the moral unless he also credit the fable, he is surely greedy of delusion and will hardly avoid deception in theories of this nature. The error, therefore, and allergy in this opinion is worse than in the last, 
that is, not to receive figures for realities, but to expect a verity in apologues, and believe as serious affirmations, confessed and studied fables. Again, if this were true, and that the beaver in chase makes some divulsion of parts, as that which we call castorium, yet are not the same to be termed testicles or stones. For these cods or follicles are found in both sexes, though somewhat more protuberant in the male. There is here, too, no derivation of the seminal parts, nor any passage from hence unto the vessels of ejaculation. Some perforations only in the part itself, through which the humour included doth exudate, as may be observed in such as are fresh and not much dried with age. And lastly, the testicles properly so called are of a lesser magnitude, and seated inwardly upon the loins. And therefore it were not only a fruitless attempt, but impossible act, to unicate or castrate themselves, and might be an hazardous practice of art if at all attempted by others. Now, all this is confirmed from the experimental testimony of five very memorable authors, Bellonius, Gesnerus, Amatus, Rondolitius, and Matthiolus, who, receiving the hint hereof from Rondolitius in the anatomy of two beavers, did find all true that had been delivered by him, whose words are these in his learned book De Piscibus. Fibri in inguinibus geminus tumores havent, utrinque unicum ovi anserini magnitudine, interhos est mentula in maribus in feminis pudendum, hi tumores testes non sunt, sed follicili membrana contecti, in quorum medio singuli sunt meatus equibus exudat liqua pinguis et carosus, quem ipse casto saipe ad moto ore lambit et exugit, postia velutiolio corporis partis oblinit, Hos tumores testes non esse, hinc maximo colligito, quod ab illis nulla est ad mentulam via, neque ductus quo humo in mentule miatum deriveto, et foras emitato. Praetereo quod testes intus reperiunto, eostem tumores mosco, animale in esse puto, equibus odoratum illud plus emanat, than which words there can be no plainer, nor more evidently discovering the impropriety of this appellation. That which is included in the cod or visible bag about the groin, being not the testicle or any spermatical part, but rather a collection of some superfluous matter deflowing from the body, especially the parts of nutrition as unto their proper emunctories. And as it doth in musk and civet cats, though in a different and offensive odour, proceeding partly from its food, that being especially fish, whereof this humour may be a garrus excretion and olidus separation. Most thereof of the moderns before Rondolitius and all the ancients excepting Cestius have misunderstood this part, conceiving castorium, the testicles of the beaver, as Dioscorides, Galen, Aegineta, Aetius, and others have pleased to name it. The Egyptians also failed in the ground of their hieroglyphic, when they expressed the punishment of adultery, by the beaver depriving himself of his testicles, which was amongst them the penalty of such incontinency. Nor is Aetius perhaps too strictly to be observed, when he prescribeth the stones of the otter, or river dog, as succedaneous unto Castorion. But most inexcusable of all is Pliny who having before him in one place the experiment of Cestius against it, sets down in another that the beavers of Pontus bite off their testicles, and in the same place affirmeth the like of the hyena, which was indeed well joined with the beaver as having also a bag in those parts, if thereby we understand the hyena odorata, or civet cat, as is delivered and graphically described by Castellus. Now, the ground of this mistake might be the resemblance and situation of these tumours about those parts wherein we observe the testicles in other animals, which, notwithstanding, is no well-founded elation, for the testicles are defined by their office, and not determined by place or situation, they having one office in all, but different seats in many. For, beside that, no serpent or fishes oviparous, that neither biped nor quadruped oviparous, 
have testicles exteriorly or prominent in the groin. Some also that are viviparous contain these parts within, as beside this animal, the elephant and hedgehog. If any therefore shall term these testicles, intending metaphorically, and in no strict acception, his language is tolerable, and offends our ears no more than the tropical names of plants when we read in herbals of dogs, fox, and goat stones. But if he insisteth thereon, and maintaineth a propriety in this language, our discourse hath overthrown his assertion, nor will logic permit his elation. That is, from things alike to conclude a thing the same, and from an accidental convenience, that is a similitude in place of figure, to infer a specifical congruity or substantial concurrence in nature. End of That a beaver, to escape the hunter, bites off his testicles or stones. By Sir Thomas Brown. Preparation of paradimethylaminobenzaldehyde from Organic Syntheses by various contributing authors for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection number 11 Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles. Paradimethylaminobenzaldehyde from Organic Syntheses. 1. Procedure. In a 3-litre round bottom flask fitted with a mechanical stirrer, 150 grams of technical dimethylaniline are dissolved in 750 cc of diluted hydrochloric acid, one part concentrated acid to one part water. This solution is now cooled to 0 degrees, and a solution, previously cooled to 0 degrees, of 90 grams of technical sodium nitrite, in 150 cc of water is added through a separatory funnel. During the addition of the nitrite solution, mechanical stirring should be employed and the flask cooled well with ice and salt. The addition is made at such a rate, 30 to 40 minutes for the entire addition, that the temperature does not rise above 5 degrees. The precipitate of nitrosodimethylaniline hydrochloride is filtered off with suction then washed with about 300 cc of diluted hydrochloric acid, 1 to 1. In a 2 litre beaker, 180 grams of technical dimethylaniline, 125 cc of formaldehyde, technical 40%, and 300 cc of concentrated hydrochloric acid are mixed and heated for 10 minutes on a steam bath. The mixture is now placed in a hood, and the nitrosodimethylaniline added all at once, or as rapidly as possible. The beaker is then covered with a watch glass. A vigorous reaction soon occurs and is complete in about five minutes. The resulting solution is transferred to a five-litre flask and diluted to four litres. Stirring is started and a 25% solution of sodium hydroxide is added until the red colour disappears. About 650 cc are required. The yellow benzolidine compound separates, is filtered with suction, and washed with water. The moist precipitate is transferred to a 4-litre glass jar, covered with 1,000 cc of 50% acetic acid and 250 cc of formaldehyde, and stirred until 20 minutes after the benzolidine compound has gone into solution. While the mixture is being stirred vigorously to prevent lumping of the precipitate, 400 cc of water and 200 grams of cracked ice are added during the course of five minutes. The dimethylaminobenzaldehyde generally separates gradually in 15 to 20 minutes, but in some cases does not. If the precipitate does not form, the solution is placed in a refrigerator for a few hours or overnight. The mixture is filtered with suction and washed at least 10 times with 300 cc of water. The precipitate is sucked as dry as possible for 15 to 30 minutes.
the slightly moist aldehyde is distilled under diminished pressure from an oil bath by means of a one litre claison flask a small amount of water comes over first then the thermometer rises rapidly to the boiling point of the aldehyde a hundred and eighty degrees twenty two millimetres in changing receivers between the water fraction and the aldehyde care should be taken to keep the side arm of the distilling flask warm otherwise on starting the distillation again the aldehyde will solidify in the side arm and cause trouble it is advisable not to collect the very last portion of the distillate with the main portion as the former is frequently quite red this is best added to crude material from another run the main distillate is dissolved in a hundred cc of alcohol in a two litre beaker then one thousand cc of water are gradually added with vigorous mechanical stirring to prevent lumping the aldehyde separates and is filtered with suction the product when dry weighs a hundred and twenty five to a hundred and thirty grams fifty six to fifty nine per cent of the theoretical result and melts at seventy three degrees the aldehyde prepared in this way is in the form of small granular crystals which vary in different runs from a flesh colour to a lemon yellow for practically all purposes this slightly coloured product is entirely satisfactory and is essentially pure as can be judged by the melting point for reagent purposes it is desirable to remove the colour completely particularly since the product obtained as just described has a tendency to take on a reddish tinge on exposure to light further purification can be accomplished by dissolving the aldehyde it dissolves slowly in dilute hydrochloric acid one part of concentrated acid specific gravity one point one nine to six parts of water one hundred and twenty five grams of aldehyde requiring seven hundred cc of the acid the solution is placed in a jar and diluted with half its volume of water and dilute sodium hydroxide solution fifteen to twenty per cent is added slowly with mechanical stirring at the beginning the aldehyde comes down slightly coloured after about ten to thirty grams of precipitated however the product appears white this point can be readily seen the first precipitate is filtered off and added to the next run of crude material or fractionally precipitated again from hydrochloric acid the rest of the aldehyde is now precipitated by means of more sodium hydroxide solution and comes down almost white at the very end of the neutralization particularly if the original product was quite yellow the last four to five grams of aldehyde should be precipitated separately as they are inclined to be slightly coloured if too much alkali is added towards the end of the neutralization a brown colour appears but the addition of a little hydrochloric acid will destroy this colour the main portion of the precipitate is filtered and dried it weighs ninety five to a hundred grams melting point seventy three degrees the succeeding runs yield a hundred and fifteen to a hundred and twenty eight grams of the finished product on account of the extra crude material obtained from the distillation and reprecipitation of the previous run two notes the aldehyde that is obtained without reprecipitation gradually takes on a pinkish tinge on exposure to light after the reprecipitation however this characteristic disappears thorough washing of the crude aldehyde is particularly desirable as it removes a reddish impurity which tends to distill over and colour the product lemon yellow or sometimes even brownish yellow when such a brownish product is obtained it is quite necessary to make a second precipitation as well as to observe the directions mentioned in the purification of the crude aldehyde namely to precipitate the first few grams and the last few grams of the aldehyde separately the precaution of rejecting the first and last portions of the precipitate is unnecessary in the reprecipitation in the reprecipitation of a deeply coloured product the portion of aldehyde at the end may be even purplish in colour and particular care must be taken to keep this separate vigorous mechanical stirring must be employed during the precipitation of the crude aldehyde as otherwise large lumps are formed which make washing difficult a previous investigator has mentioned that the crude product must be dried before distilling this however is unnecessary 
if the aldehyde is dried before distilling, it is possible to use a 500cc distilling flask instead of a 1 litre one. In purifying the aldehyde by dissolving in acid and reprecipitating, it is essential not to use stronger acid than that specified, 1 to 6, as stronger acid causes a deepening of the colour of the solution. If the concentrated acid, which is to be diluted and used in this procedure, does not have a specific gravity of 1.19, it will be necessary to add the equivalent amount of weaker acid in order to dissolve the paradimethylaminobenzaldehyde. In purifying the aldehyde, sodium carbonate may be used in place of sodium hydroxide for precipitation, but it causes much foaming. When the apparatus for distilling, etc., is all set up, a run such as described above requires about five to six hours for completion. 3. Other methods of preparation Paradimethylaminobenzaldehyde has been made by the condensation of chloral with dimethylaniline and subsequent hydrolysis. By the hydrolysis of tetramethyldiaminobenzhydrol with acetic acid, by the condensation of dimethylaniline, formaldehyde, and metasulfoparatolylhydroxylamine, followed by hydrolysis. By the electrolytic reduction of a mixture of sodium nitrobenzene sulfonate, dimethylaniline, and formaldehyde, and subsequent hydrolysis. By the reduction of a mixture of dimethylaniline, formaldehyde, and sodium nitrobenzene sulfonate with iron and hydrochloric acid, followed by hydrolysis. By the condensation of alloxin with dimethylaniline, followed by hydrolysis. By the condensation of dimethylaniline, formaldehyde, and sodium paratoluidine sulfonate in the presence of hydrochloric acid and potassium dichromate, followed by hydrolysis. The most satisfactory method, however, is the condensation of dimethylaniline, formaldehyde, and nitrosodimethylaniline, followed by hydrolysis, a method which was first described by E. Nelting and later perfected in detail by L. Bauman. End of Paradimethylaminobenzaldehyde by various contributing authors. Recording by Son of the Exiles. Mars and its Canals for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection number 11. Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles. Mars and its Canals by Percival Lowell. Chapter 30. The Evidence. Of the existence of animal life upon a far planet, any evidence must, of necessity, assume a different guise from what its flora would present. Plant life should be, as on Mars we perceive it is, recognisable as part and parcel of the main features of the planet's face. In no such forthright manner could we expect an animal revelation. The sort of testimony which would render the one patent would leave the other obstinately hid. So long as animate life was in the lowest sense animal, it would not be seen at all, though it were as widespread as the vegetal life all around it. Reason for this lies in their receptive character. Plants are fixtures. Where they start, they stay. While, from the nature of their food, derived directly from the soil and from the air, and conditioned chiefly by warmth and moisture, like forms inhabit large areas and by their mass defect make far impression. With animals it is otherwise. They feed by forage, from beetle to buffalo, roaming the land for sustenance. Thus both for paucity of number and from not abiding in one stay, they must escape notice at a distance, such that as individuals they fail to show, to say nothing of the fact that the flora usually overtop the fauna, and so help to hide the latter while appearing itself distinct. Any far view of our earth gives instance of this. Seen from some panoramic height, forest and moorland lie patently outspread in view, yet imagination is taxed to believe them tenanted at all. Unless man have marred the landscape, 
not a sign appears of any living thing. One must be near indeed to note even such unusual sights as a herd of buffalo in the plains, or those immense flights of pigeons that in former years occurred like clouds darkening the sky. From the standpoint of another planet, though any such direct showing animal existence would still remain unknown. Not until the creatures had reached a certain phase in evolution would their presence become perceptible, and not then directly, but by the result such presence brought to pass. Occupancy would be first evidenced by its imprint on the land, discernible thus initially not so much by the bodily as by the mind's eye. For not till the animal had learnt to dominate nature and fashion it to his needs and ends would his existence betray itself. By the transformation he wrought in the landscape would he be known. It is thus we should make our own far acquaintance, and by the disarrangement of nature first have inkling of man. That it is thus we should betray ourselves, a consideration of man's history will show. While he still remained of savage simplicity, a mere child of nature, he might come and go unmarked by an outsider, but so soon as he started in to possess the earth, his handicraft would reveal him. From the moment he bethought him to till the ground, he entered upon a course of world subjugation of which we cannot see the end. But he has already advanced far enough to give us an idea of the process. It began with agriculture. Deforestation, with its subsequent quartering of crops, signalised his acquisition of real estate. His impress was at first sporadic and irregular, and in so far followed that of nature itself. But as it advanced, it took on a methodism of plan. Husbandry begot thrift, and augmented wants demanded an increasing return for toil. And to this desirable end, systematization became a necessity. At the same time, gregariousness grew, and still further emphasized the need for economy of space and time. In part unconsciously, Man learnt the laws that govern the expenditure of force, and more and more consciously applied them. Geometry, unloosed of Euclid, became a part of everyday life, as insidiously as Monsieur Jourdain found that he had been talking prose. Regularity rules today to the lament of art. The railroad is straighter than the turnpike, as that is straighter than the trail. Communication is now urgent in its demands to know anything but law and take other than the shortest path to its destination. Tillage has undergone a like rectification. To one used to the patchwork quilting of the crops in older lands, the methodical rectangles of the farms of the Great West are painfully exact. Yet it is more than probable that these material manifestations would be the first signs of intelligence to one considering the earth from far. Our towns would in all likelihood constitute the next, and lastly, the great arteries of travel that minister to their wants. Their scale too would render them the first objects to be observed. Farming, as now practised in Kansas and Dakota, gives it a certain cosmical concern. Fields for miles turning in hue with the rhythm of the drilled should impress an eye, if armed with our appliances, many millions of miles away. Even now we should know ourselves cosmically by our geometrical designs. To interplanetary understanding it is this quality that would speak. Still more so will it tell as time goes on. As yet we are but at the beginning of our subjugation of the globe. We have hardly explored it at all, still less occupied it. When we do so, and space shall have become enhancedly precious, directness of purpose with economy of result will have partitioned so regularly the surface of the earth as to impart to it an artificiality of appearance, and it becomes one vast coordinated expanse subservient entirely to the wants of its possessors. Centres of population and lines of communication with tillage carried on in the most economic way. To this it must come in the end. Nor is this outcome in any sense a circumstance accidental to the earth. It is an inevitable phase in the evolution of organisms. As the organism develops brain, it is able to circumvent the adversities of condition, and by overcoming more pronounced inhospitality of environment, not only to survive, but spread. 
evidence of this thought will be stamped more and more visibly upon the face of its habitat. On earth, for all our pride of intellect, we have not yet progressed very far from the lowly animal state that leaves no records of itself. It is only in the last two centuries that our self-registration upon our surroundings has been marked. With another planet, the like course must in all probability be pursued, and the older the life relatively to its habitat, the more its signs of occupation should show. Intelligence on other worlds could then only make its presence known by such material revelation, and the sign manuals of itself would appear more artificial in look as that life was high in rank. Given the certainty of plant life, such markings are what one would look to find. Criticism, which refuses to credit detail of the sort because too bizarre to be true, writes itself down as unacquainted with the character of the problem. For it is precisely such detail which would show if any evidence at all were forthcoming. If now we turn our inquiry to Mars, we shall be fairly startled at what its disc discloses. For we find ourselves confronted in the canals and oases by precisely the appearances a priori reasoning proves should show were the planet inhabited. Our abstract prognostications have taken concrete form. Here, in these rectilineal lines and roundish spots, we have spread out our centres of effort and our lines of communication. For the oases are clearly ganglia to which the canals play the part of nerves. The strange geometricism which proves inexplicable on any other hypothesis now shows itself of the essence of the solution. The appearance of artificiality cast up at the phenomena in disproof vindicates itself as the vital point in the whole matter. Like the cachet of an architect, it is the thing about the building that established the authorship. Though the Earth and Mars agree in being planets, they differ constitutionally in several important respects. Even to us the curious network that enshrouds the Martian disk suggests handicraft. It implies it much more when considered from a Martian standpoint. End of Mars and its Canals by Percival Lowell Recording by Son of the Exiles The Complete Genome of the Porcine Circovirus for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 11. Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in April 2015. The Complete Genome of the Porcine Circovirus from Archives of Virology, Volume 143, Number 9. 1998. GTAG, TATT, ACCA, GCGC, ACTT, CGGC, AGCG, GCAG, CACC, TCGG, CAGC, GTCA, GTGA, AAAT, GCCA AGCA AGAA AAGC GGCC CGCA ACCC CATA AGAG GTGG GTGT TCAC CCTT AATA ATCC TTCC GAGG AGGA GAAA AACA AAAT ACGG GAGC TTCC AATC TCCC TTTT TGAT TATT TTGT TTGC GGAG AGGA AGGT TTGG AAGA GGGT AGAA CTCC TCAC CTCC AGGG 
GTTT, GCGA, ATTT, TGCT. AAGA, AGCA, GACT, TTTA, ACAA, GGTG, AAGT, GGTA, TTTT, GGTG, CCCG, CTGC, CACA, TCGA, GAAA. GCGA, AAGG, AACC, GACC, AGCA, GAAT, AAAG, AATA, CTGC, AGTA, AAGA, AGGT, CACA, TACT, TATC. GAGT, GTGG, AGCT, CCGC, GGAA, CCAG, GGGA, AGCG, CAGC, GACC, TGTC, TACT, GCTG, TGAG, TACC. CTTT, TGGA, GACG, GGGT, CTTT, GGTG, ACTG, TAGC, CGAG, CAGT, TCCC, TGTA, ACGT, ATGT, GAGA. AATT, TCCG, CGGG, CTGG, CTGA, ACTT, TTGA, AAGT, GAGC, GGGA, AGAT, GCAG, CAGC, GTGA, TTGG. AAGA, CAGC, TGTA, CACG, TCAT, AGTG, GGCC, CGCC, CGGT, TGTG, GGAA, GAGC, CAGT, GGGC, CCGT. AATT, TTAC, TGAG, CCTA, GCGA, CACC, TACT, GGAA, GCCT, AGTA, GAAA, TAAG, TGGT, GGGA, TGGA. TATC, ATGG, AGAA, GAAG, TTGT, TGTT, TTGG, ATGA, TTTT, TATG, GCTG, GTTA, CCTT, GGGA, TGAT. CTAC, TGAG, ACTG, TGTG, ACCG, GTAT, CCAT, TGAC, TGTA, GAGA, CTAA, AGGC, GGTA, CTGT, TCCT. TTTT, TGGC, CCGC, AGTA, TTTT, GATT, ACCA, GCAA, TCAG, GCCC, CCCA, GGAA, TGGT, ACTC, CTCA. ACTG, CTGT, CCCA, GCTG, TAGA, AGCT, CTCT, ATCG, GAGG, ATTA, CTAC, TTTG, CAAT, TTTG, GAAG. 
ACTG, CTGG, AGAA, CAAT, CCAC, GGAG, GTAC, CCGA, AGGC, CGAT, TTGA, AGCA, GTGG, ACCC, ACCC. TGTG, CCCT, TTTC, CCAT, ATAA, AATA, AATT, ACTG, AGTC, TTTT, TTGT, TATC, ACAT, CGTA, ATGG. TTTT, TATT, TTTA, 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 GAGG, TCTT, TTAG, GATA, AATT, CTCT, GAAT, TGTA, CATA, AATA, GTCA, GCCT, TACC, ACAT, AATT, TTGG, GCTG, TGGC, TGCA, TTTT, GGAG, CGCA, TAGC, CGAG, GCCT, GTGT, GCTC, GACA, TTGG, TGTG, GGTA, TTTA, AATG, GAGC, CACA, GCTG, GTTT, CTTT, TATT, ATTT, GGGT, GGAA, CCAA, TCAA, TTGT, TTGG, TCCA, GCTC, AGGT, TTGG, GGGT, GAAG, TACC, TGGA, GTGG, TAGG, TAAA, GGGC, TGCC, TTAT, GGTG, TGGC, GGGA, GGAG, TAGT, TAAT, ATAG, GGGT, CATA, GGCC. AAGT, TGGT, GGAG, GGGG, TTAC, AAAG, TTGG, CATC, CAAG, ATAA, CAAC, AGTG, GACC, CAAC, ACCT. CTTT, GATT, AGAG, GTGA, TGGG, GTCT, CTGG, GGTA, AAAT, TCAT, ATTT, AGCC, TTTC, TAAT, ACGG, TAGT, ATTG, GAAA, GGTA, GGGG, TAGG, GGGT, TGGT, GCCG, CCTG, AGGG, GGGG, AGGA, ACTG, GCCG, ATGT, TGAA, TTTG, AGGT, AGTT, AACA, TTCC, AAGA, TGGC, TGCG, AGTA, TCCT, CCTT, TTAT, GGTG. AGTA, CCAA, TTCT, GTAG, AAAG, GCGG, GAAT, TGAA, GATA, CCCG, TCTT, TCGG, CGCC, ATCT, GTAA, CGGT, T 
GTTCT, GAAG, GCGG, GGTG, TGCC, AAAT, ATGG, TCTT, CTCC, GGAG, GATG, TTTC, CAAG, ATGG. CTGC, GGGG, GCGG, GTCC, TTCT, TCTG, CGGT, AACG, CCTC, CTTG, GCCA, CGTC, ATCC, TATA, AAAG, TGAA, AGAA, GTGC, GCTG, CT. End of the complete genome of the porcine circovirus.